All right, good morning, everyone. Um, wow, it's good to see y'all. So they have the B team up here today. Uh, I'm Patrick. Uh, <laughs> so I am our kids pastor and young adults pastor here at Stillwater, and I'm very excited uh, to be here with you guys um, and to see um, so many of you this morning. Um, yeah, so we are continuing in our series on the Ascent Psalms uh, this morning with Psalm 129. Uh, the big thing that we are talking about today is just going to be confidence in the Lord in the midst of suffering and affliction. And the reason I think this is so important for us to talk about, so important for us to know, is that we're guaranteed suffering and affliction are going to come in this life. But at the same time, suffering and affliction is one of the, the main reasons people turn away from the Lord. Because what's going on in their life, they think, uh, they feel like it's too great and how... How can God be good? How can I trust in God with all this going on? But we want to walk well. We want to walk well with the Lord. We know he's good. So somehow, guaranteed that we're going to face this suffering and affliction in life, we've got to figure out how do we grow closer to the Lord? How do we increase our confidence in the Lord rather than be drawn away from him in our suffering? And that's what I think Psalm 129 is talking about today. So as we're looking at it, we're going to be talking about um, how we can suffer but not be overcome. We're going to talk about the reason for our hope in the midst of suffering and how we ought to pray for those who inflict the suffering on us. And at the end of it, um, I'm going to share a story of a lady I think is pretty neat. Um, but yeah, before we, we hop into Psalm 129, let's pray together real quick. Lord, thank you so much for this morning. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for your word, which you have preserved for us, God, that uh, your, your, your word, Lord, is alive and well, uh, and the message you have for your people Israel through this psalm you have for us as well today. Um, God, help us to learn what that is, what you show us, what you put me to the side uh, and speak through me today, Lord. Um, help us all to grow more in confidence in you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. So like I said, this is one of the Ascent Psalms. So the Ascent Psalms are a series of 15 psalms that uh, we believe the people of Israel, as they were going up to the temple uh, to pray and to worship, they would sing these songs either on the way up, uh, traveling to the temple, or on the stairs going up to the temple. Uh, and it's just psalms for the community to sing and, and praise about their Lord and praise of Yahweh, uh, the name of God. Right, and this psalm is about confidence through the Lord through a long history of affliction and suffering. And if you know anything about the history of Israel, it's a long history of affliction and suffering. That uh, from their youth, right, that just as they, they became a nation, they, they ended up uh, in Egypt because of famine in the land. Many of you know the story about Joseph, his coat of many colors, how he uh, delivered his people uh, through God elevating him in Egypt. But then, they suffered for 400 years as slaves in Egypt. God delivered them, and then they went into the wilderness, and they turned away from God. They made the golden calf and suffered for 40 years in the wilderness because of their sin and disobedience, but still a long 40 years. And then they finally get into the land. They conquer most of it, and uh, they leave a few people unconquered, and um, they're... they're start giving into idolatry and other things for which they're punished. They're given over to the hands of their enemies, uh, the Moabites, the Philistines, and countless other funny names, and are ruled over them until they eventually cry out for deliverance, and God delivers them. We get to Saul and, and the united kingdom of, of Israel, and, and we see David and Solomon after him. But because of Solomon's sins and he starts going after other gods, start worshiping other gods, building temples to other gods because of the many wives he took that were worshiping these other gods. He started to as well, and we see the kingdom divided, ten tribes to the northern kingdom of Israel and then the southern kingdom of Judah. Northern kingdom, 722, goes into exile or conquered by the Assyrians. Southern kingdom of Judah, 586 B.C., taken into exile by the Babylonians and are there for 70 years in exile in Babylon. Before and God raises up uh, the Medo Persian Empire, they take over Babylon. People get to go home, right? And then they're going to rebuild the temple because it was destroyed when they were taken away. 
and there, there's opposition to facing the temple. And then later, Greek becomes the world power, and then Rome. And we know how terrible Rome is, just the fact that their method for executing prisoners was crucifixion, uh, the most horrible way of death in uh, every sense imaginable, humiliating, painful. The word excruciating comes from, it finds its origin in crucifixion to just describe that pain. Israel has suffered long. It's a long history of suffering. And then even since Christ, it's a long history of suffering, most notably for us, the Holocaust. If you look at the Middle East nowadays, they're not too, in, too hot also. There's a lot of conflict, a lot of affliction for the people of Israel. And I don't know exactly when this psalm was written, but they're thinking back to this, this long history as they would go to this song. And it, it's supposed to be a psalm that turns that long history of affliction, I guess I should step back a second, into praise and confidence of God. So they would look back in retrospect to their suffering, and they would sing psalms like this one, turning this affliction into praise, and reminding themselves, teaching each other through these psalms where they were to put their confidence, where it was to come from, and how they were to continue forward in their suffering. And this was a psalm of confidence for the community, reflecting on what they've been through and how God's delivered them, and gaining confidence that this is the same God who's present with them and sustaining them today. He's delivered them, he's going to deliver them again. So with that being said, let's hop into it. If you open up your Bible, Psalm 129, verse 1, it says, Greatly they have afflicted me from my youth. Let Israel now say, Greatly have they afflicted me from my youth, yet they have not prevailed against me. The plowers plowed upon my back, they may long their furrows. The Lord is righteous, he has cut the cords of the wicked. And we're going to stop there for now. So the first point I take from this is just that we suffer, but we're not overcome. As they said, you know, they have plowed upon my back. They make long their furrows. Just before that, they've afflicted me from my youth, yet they have not prevailed against me. And this imagery, right, of they have plowed upon my back and made long their furrows. If you're at all um, familiar with agriculture and what a plow does is it's got these furrows that dig into the ground, tear up dirt, uh, break it apart, gouge it out to pull it up out of the earth, right, uh, so the soil is soft and you can plant and you know, reap a harvest and all that fun stuff. But he's, he's imagining his suffering in a sense of lying in a field and having somebody take a plow over your back. The same thing it does to the earth, a gouging deep, ripping out the dirt, pulling it up. It's like somebody's doing that upon his back to, to his flesh. And it's like, if it, my back's a little tense thinking about it. Right, just picturing what would that feel like, and it's not a light bruising. They make long their furrows. These parts of the plow that dig deep into the earth, it's like, hey, they're making them even longer. This is merciless and brutal suffering at the hands of the ones afflicting them. They're making sure it's terrible, right? It's not a light bruising, but a deep gouging. And I don't know what suffering you've been through or what pain you felt in your life, if maybe. Uh, it hasn't been that great. Maybe you've, you've been blessed and, you, and your, your suffering hasn't been um, immensely painful. But for some of you, I know some of your stories, right? I'm going to share one at the end of it, where the suffering is just so brutal. And I don't know what that is for you. If it's mental or physical abuse, if it's uh, perhaps coming from somebody you trusted and uh, is no longer there and it cuts deep. Perhaps it's just a relentless one thing after another. You feel like you can never catch a break, like you never stop having bad days. And, and this, this passage is not referring to just one bad day, but a long history of bad days. Greatly have they afflicted me from my youth until now. Yet in all these things, the psalmist says they're not overcome. They remain the victor. Why? Because the God whom they worship is righteous. Our God, the Lord, is righteous. He is mightier than the ones who afflict them. He is good. He keeps good on his promises. The suffering's real. It's intensely real. He describes it. It, it sounds horrible. It doesn't change the fact that the God they worship is good. And he is righteous. And he's going to keep his promises. And they remain victorious because of that. And he says, no, in, all, in Paul, 
I think, speaks kind of in this, this same spirit, same attitude uh, in Romans 8. He says, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I'm convinced that neither death nor life, angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, nor height, death, anything in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So if that's true of all those things, how much more is it true that those who afflict you, the, the suffering that's caused to you by other people or maybe just from the brokenness of this world, it's not going to be able to separate you from the love that is in Christ either. And that's why we're not overcome. And this is a truth, that, that we can suffer but not be overcome. They do not prevail against us. I think it's important to know this because sometimes that doesn't feel true. Sometimes the weight of our suffering and our grief is so heavy that it feels like we'll never be free of it. We feel hopeless sometimes, not sure how to continue. But it's just like, Jesus, if you can come back now and sort this mess out, that'd be great. <laughs> like, I don't know what to do anymore. Sometimes it just feels like we're doomed to a life of struggle and things aren't going to turn out right. Yet despite how we may feel in our suffering, the very truth remains that God is going to deliver us. And it's because of him that we can endure suffering without being defeated. That despite how we feel in our suffering, and those emotions are very real, that suffering is very real, the truth remains God's going to deliver you. Uh, Jesus says in John 16, 20, Very truly, I tell you, you will weep and mourn while the world rejoices. You will grieve, but your grief will be turned to joy. And these are the promises of God, who is righteous, who keeps his promises as true to his word. So ultimately, knowing this to be true, I think in response, we need to throw ourselves entirely upon the grace and mercy of our righteous king because he's a firm foundation. Because he's righteous, he doesn't change. His promises don't change. He doesn't make a promise and goes back on it like many of us probably have at some point in our lives. Or have had somebody do to us at some point. And he's going to be faithful to deliver us and preserve us through our suffering. So one thing I want to point out is notice how this community gathers together to recount these sufferings. To, to talk about the faithfulness of God, the goodness of God. Let Israel now say, the, the greatly they have afflicted me from my youth, that me is referring to the whole nation of Israel. This isn't just one person. This is the nation gathered together talking. It's like, look at what we've been through. Look at what we've suffered. Yet look at what God has done to preserve us. And that builds confidence in the Lord that as we throw ourselves on him, as we trust in him, as we, we see what he's done in our lives and then the lives of others, how can it not result but in confidence of God. Isaiah 63, 7 says that I will recount the gracious deeds of the Lord, the praiseworthy acts of the Lord, because of all that the Lord has done for us and the great favor to the house of Israel that he's shown according to his mercy, according to the abundance of his steadfast love. His steadfast love that never changes. Why? Because he's righteous. But I'll recount the gracious deeds of God, the praiseworthy acts. Like when we think about what God has done, it can't result in anything but praise when we see his goodness and his faithfulness in our lives. And, you know, this is talking about in suffering, if you're one who hasn't suffered deeply, I'm honestly blessed. There's been some things I've dealt with, yeah, but I know plenty of people who have been much worse. Because when we come together as a community and, and, and recount all that together, sharing our story, sharing what God's delivered us from, we can be encouraged. You know, it's just proof of that. Lee Carpenter, if you know him, he comes to the first service, was talking to me, sharing with me a story about his brother that really encouraged me. And that I wouldn't have the courage or confidence to keep trusting the Lord in, in one area of my life if it wasn't for the fact that if he came in, it's like, God, he didn't quite know it when he shared it, but suffering through a lot of the same stuff he is, a heartache, or just wanted to see a sibling turn to the Lord. And it's like, yeah, it took till he was 88, but God's faithful. Yeah, I can still trust because, you know, Lee's showing 88 years of trying to get him to turn to the Lord. And God's showing, hey, he's faithful. When we come together, we hear the stories of people who have been through different circumstances, worse circumstances, whatever. 
we can learn from each other and build each other's confidence that the Lord is like, no, see what God has done for me. He's done this for me. He is just as faithful to work in your life in the same way. As such a beauty of biblical community, and I, I think that that's why we emphasize it so much as Stillwater. There's several people from my life group on Monday night who are here, and it's like, I don't even think they realize how much just sitting around talking and sharing prayer requests of what we're going through and then learning about the Lord together, how much they build into me and encourage me and give me confidence in the Lord. And maybe if, if you're in the room and, and you've experienced that as well, you can now just be like, yeah, you know, it's done the same for me. It's the beauty of biblical community, of recounting what God has done in our lives and sharing that with one another to build each other up. Why? Because suffering is hard. But the truth remains, God is good, and he'll continue to be good to where we can cry out and trust that as Psalm 32, 7 says, you are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble and surround me with songs of deliverance. So as they reflect as a community on what God has done, they grow in confidence of what he'll continue to do to deliver him, to deliver them, that they won't be overcome, that their suffering will ultimately come to an end. Why? I've said that kind of already, but the Lord is righteous. And we see that in Psalm uh, verse 4. The Lord is righteous. He has cut the cords of the wicked. And just staying with this verse for a moment more, I think because the Lord is righteous, we know our suffering will come to a sure end. It's not going to last forever. It's going to come to a sure end. That plow imagery that he has of plowing over your back, well, they didn't have a tractor to pull it. It was uh, pulled by uh, attaching the plow by ropes to a yoke on the back of an oxen, put this a yoke, a piece of wood on the back of uh, its neck and attach that by wooden cord or wooden cords by cords and ropes to the plow wooden cords that would be impressive um, to the plow so this idea that our, he's going to cut the cords of the wicked or he has cut the cords of the wicked is this imagery of hey plow can't be pulled anymore that type of suffering has come to an end it's useless you can't pull a plow across your back if the cords are broken. And I think ultimately that this means God is true to his promises. He'll keep his word. He's going to deliver and restore his people. And he's going to put an end to wickedness. I mean, if, if you notice, it says he has cut the cords of the wicked. In the Hebrew, this is a perfect verb, meaning it's a completed action. It's already happened. And maybe this is looking back at, at your past, and it's like, yeah, in all these circumstances, he, he cut the cords of the wicked, the suffering came to an end, I can continue to trust. Or maybe it's just trusting that, hey, what Jesus did on the cross, hey, he has ultimately cut the cords of the wicked. Uh, sin is impotent. It's uh, a powerless enemy against us now. And we know our, our, our victory and the glory we'll have with Christ is assured because of what he's already done. He has certainly done it. God will certainly rescue his people because he is righteous, and he's righteous. He keeps his promises to preserve and rescue, to deal with the wicked. He's not going to allow wickedness to go unpunished. The beginning of Nahum says, you know, the Lord will certainly punish the wicked. And hopefully, prayerfully, as the people of faith who realize that we were once wicked, that's, you know, their punishment falls on Christ as they seek him in repentance, just like it did for us in our case. But ultimately, whether they turn to Christ and find repentance or not, God's going to deal with the wickedness and evil of this world. It's not going to go unaccounted for, and he's not going to abandon us. It's not like you're lost and you're suffering without the Lord. So I will never leave you nor forsake you, and he never has, and he never will. And we see this in, in other promises in the Psalms. Psalm 94, he will bring back on them their iniquity, wipe them out for their wickedness. The Lord will wipe them out. So, okay, he's going to deal with the wicked one way or another. Psalm 34, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. He keeps all of his bones, not one of them is broken. Affliction will slay the wicked, and those who hate the righteous will be condemned. But the Lord redeems the life of his servants. None of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. Like, these are the promises of God, and if he's righteous, not changing, keeps his promises, these are the promises for us. This is why we can have hope and confidence in the Lord. Our suffering will come to an end one way or another. 
And I think knowing that the Lord is righteous and our suffering will come to an end is important because it gives that confidence to where we can still worship the Lord even in the midst of our suffering. Because if we truly believe he keeps his promises, then we know one day he's going to deal with the wicked, punishing them unless they turn and find repentance in Christ. If he truly keeps his promises and we trust that, if we have confidence in that, that we know what he's promised for the end of the story, we win. We get to see our Lord face to face and be with him for forever. Where he wipes away every tear for our eyes, we get to embrace our Savior, our God. And he himself will save us from every evil. And if you reflect on all that God's already done, you can see that and keep having confidence that the God who never changes is going to continue to do what he's always done. I think that's one of the things Kurt always says. God's just doing what God does. God's doing what God always does. As he always does is preserves his people. Even in the midst of the worst you can go through, he preserves you. We know he is good, and he set an end date for our suffering. That way we can endure our suffering with confident assurance that he, again, will deliver us. Knowing all this, let us trust that that day is surely coming. It's hard to believe some days that that day is surely coming when you're in the midst of your suffering, but continue to trust that no matter what, a day is coming uh, that he is promised where he'll deliver us and we will be with him. And Revelation 21, 1 through 4 talks about this. It's one of my favorite passages in scripture. It's like when people ask me, you know, what is your favorite verse? It's just like, well, this is all so rich, but this describes our future hope. Revelation 21, 1, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven, the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. And he will dwell with them and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. That one day, a day is surely coming where all of your suffering, all of your tears and your grief will be cared for. Your tears will be wiped away by the very God who created you. Where all of the suffering of this life you don't have to deal with anymore. Why? Because everything is set right to how it should have been in the first place. And it's our God who does it. It is your righteous God, Stillwater, that's going to deliver you, not yourself. So trust confidently in him because this day that is talking about, where all things are made new, where you are made new, and you get to dwell and see your God face to face, none of the suffering of this life compares to that moment. Trust that that day is coming. That can give us confidence through our suffering. We know that the day is coming to end our suffering. Man, that is not going to last forever. Worship in your suffering, trusting that this day is going to come. This is the only time in this world, before all things are made new, where you get to worship in the midst of suffering. Because when we're in glory with God, there's going to be no suffering or mourning or crying or pain. This is the one chance that you have in this life Put your confidence and hope and trust in God that though you can't see that day yet, you know it's coming, you know he's good, and you're going to worship him regardless of whatever circumstance comes your way. But no matter how much other people may afflict you or hate you for whatever reason, you know this is coming. Your one chance to worship in suffering. So as we trust that day is coming, it leaves us with the fact that, well, we're still here. We're still dealing with those who, who afflict us, with those who, who cause us pain. And how, how do we deal with that? I think verses 5 through 8 get into that a little bit. So verse 5, may all who hate Zion be put to shame and turned backwards. Let them be like the grass on the housetop, which withers before it grows up, with which the reaper does not fill his hand, nor the binder of sheaves his arms. Nor do those who pass by say the blessing of the Lord be upon you. 
we bless you in the name of the Lord. There's kind of a lot going on in those verses. Let's unpack this. First of all, Zion is uh, in reference to the people of God. Zion was, yes, a place, a mountain at first, but a lot of times how they would write in the Old Testament, they would refer to a place to refer to the people. Jerusalem would be used to talk about the Jews. Right? We would be talking about the, the southern kingdom of Judah when they would say uh, in, in Samaria, it was referring to those who were in uh, the northern kingdom when uh, Old Testament is talking about it. So it says Zion is referring to the people who live there, God's people, his called out people. So it says, may all who hate Zion, who hate the people of the Lord, who he's called out, be put to shame and turned backwards. And from, from these four verses, just a point I think we need to take is that we should pray both against the wicked and for the wicked. Right? And here's how he prays against them. May they be turned backwards. May those who hate the people of Zion, may those who hate Zion, the people of the Lord. And th this isn't people who you just don't get along with, you don't like, you're praying against because you don't like them. It's not personal enemies. It's those who are against the Lord, against what the Lord is doing, who actively you know, hate God's people, his plan of salvation, hate these things. You're, you're, you're praying about the enemies of God, not your personal enemies. And when, you, when we're praying, it means that we should pray against their successes. They'd be put to shame and turned backwards. You know, if you go to battle and you're put to shame and turned backwards, you didn't win. Right? And there, there's some idea, I feel like here, of the, the turn backwards. Turn backwards is pretty much the definition of repentance is to turn back, to turn around. So you're praying they'd be put shame and, and turn away from what they're doing. Whether that's just that ceasing, I think we take it an extra step from what we know in the New Testament of praying that they would turn to Christ, that they would recognize that God is God, he's good, that they've been opposed to him and they need him. To change their mind about him. So this, is, this isn't a vindictive prayer. This isn't praying that you know, anyone would go to hell or be punished. It's, it's praying that their plans would ultimately fail and it's okay to pray that their plans fail to pray against them in that way because what if their plans are for wickedness if their plans are against the plans of god if they're evil well we don't want that abounding in our world but we want love to abound we want grace to abound so pray that hey their plans would fail the withered grass Ultimately, that, hey, they'd be useless of no benefit to anybody because if, if they are, are withered grass, you know, this, this continued agriculture imagery of, of you know, reapers going in for the harvest and as they would reap, you know, they fill up their hands uh, with the crop and, and the binders of sheaves who would bind the crop together, you know, fill his arms with everything he's gathered to go and is saying, hey, would they be like the withered like the grass on a housetop, which withers before it grows up, which before this turns into something terrible, would it wither away? And would the reaper not fill his hand or the binder she fill his arms? Ultimately, may they be useless. May their plans uh, not come to fruition. If their plans are against God, we're praying the hate, that that would stop. It would be useless. And then verse 8, nor do those who pass by say the blessing of the Lord be upon you. We bless you in the name of the Lord. Ruth 2.4 kind of shows us um, a traditional greeting between the reapers uh, as, as they would see each other. And uh, as Boaz is coming from Bethlehem, he said to the reapers, the Lord be with you. And they answered, the Lord bless you. You're praying God's blessing upon them. And the Lord here is in all caps in your English translation, which if you see that, that just means that's the name of God. That is Yahweh. And the only reason they translated the Lord, all caps, is to show some reverence because you're not supposed to take the name of the Lord your God in vain. So this was just a, a practice of revering that so they didn't accidentally take God's name in vain. They would say Lord instead. They would say Adonai instead of Yahweh. But it's like, hey, we're not going to bless and say uh, blessings upon the people who are actively working against God using God's personal name. Because they're actively working against the Lord, doing e plotting evil against the Lord and his people, we don't want to say those people are blessed by God because what they're doing is the exact opposite of what God's wanting. And, and you know, as we're praying against them and, and as they're, they're coming against the Lord, they're coming against his people's ion, they hate his people's ion, 
But when you afflict his people, you're persecuting him. When you, you hate the people of God, you hate God. You hate the one who sent them. And we see this in Acts when Paul on the road to Damascus is, is persecuting the church. You know, Jesus shows up, the risen Christ appears and says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Jesus was in heaven at this point, appeared to, to Saul in this instance, but Saul was going around persecuting the church, his people. And he, he equivalates that with, hey, you're persecuting me. But we don't want to say that's blessed. We want to avoid that blessing simply to pray uh, that all would recognize what they're doing is not of the Lord. So in this way, in our suffering, we pray against the wicked. We pray that uh, they would be turned back, put to shame, that they would fail in what they're planning to do against God, that nobody would recognize that and see that as blessed or think, oh, this is of God when it's really something that's not, and that all their plans would, would against the Lord would be fruitless. I think it's important to know how we should pray against the wicked because we got to deal with them somehow. We somehow got to deal with the fact that people are afflicting us and, and we're called to pray for them. Pray for all those things, but at the same time, we're to pray for their salvation. So we're to pray against the affliction of God's people by the wicked, but pray for the wicked. We're to pray that their efforts would fail, but also that they would turn back and find salvation in Christ. Jesus tells us in Matthew 5, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And Paul reminds us in Colossians 1, 21 through 22. He says, you who were once alienated and hostile in mind, wicked, doing evil deeds, he is now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. So you see, we pray for the salvation of the wicked, one, because Christ commanded us to, and also because we were once the wicked, those who were alienated from God, who were hostile in mind, who hated him, hate, maybe hated his people, who want nothing to do with him. We were once there. How, how dare we step in and, and not pray for them as well, act as if we're somehow better? Because... We were in their shoes until the grace of God intervened in our lives, and we'd still be there if it wasn't for the grace of God. I heard my professor once say, you know, there but for the grace of God I go, meaning I'd be in the same boat if it wasn't God intervening. All the sin that they're doing that I'm maybe looking down upon or judging them for, I'd be doing the same thing or worse if it wasn't for God's grace. There's nothing special in me that I did to, to change that, but we see in the same First, where he's saying you were once alienated, hostile mind, doing evil deeds. He, meaning Christ, has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before God. You being holy, blameless, above reproach before God was nothing you did because Christ came in and reconciled you because he paid the price of your sin by his death. Eight years ago, still an enemy of God. And praise God, there were people who were praying for me, realizing that they at one point were enemies of God needed salvation, and I still did too. Thinking about all this, knowing all of this, I think we need to begin praying and never cease praying for the wicked, both against their schemes, that they would be fruitless, and pray that they would be saved. And one thing, that needs mentioning is maybe you're on the other side of this. Maybe you feel, and I, I've, I've known some people who just, you know, I'm, I'm going to hell because I know what I've done. How can I be forgiven? I know what I've done to hurt other people. I know how I've afflicted other people. Well, if you're listening to this and you feel like the wicked one, the one who's caused other people so much hurt and pain, hey, there's good news. This God is still a God of salvation for you. He's calling you to return. There is forgiveness. There is redemption for you as well. And Paul, the one who's writing, who, who wrote just about half of the New Testament, a little over half if you think he wrote Hebrews. But Paul is reminding himself that, hey, I am the foremost sinner. If Christ can, can save me, there is no problem with saving any of you. Because he says, if he can save me as a foremost sinner, the worst sinner, then I'm an example to all about the patience of God, that they might believe, that they may turn to him and find forgiveness. 
Because if he can save a wretch like me, the guy who tried to wipe out the church, killing and persecuting Christians, thinking that this was uh, heresy, that it was nonsense, that it was against God when it was really something God was doing, and God can transform him and make him new to where he uh, was one of the greatest missionaries of the church, save you as well. I don't know what you've done. He does. His call is still there. He still loves you. Same thing for those who are wicked in our lives, who are afflicting us. And guys, it's hard to pray for the wicked. And sometimes it's easier to pray against them. God, would you just deal with them? Especially, you know, I don't think many of us like the people who cause us hurt and pain so much. Or maybe sometimes it's hard because maybe it's a family member. You do love them in some way, but they keep hurting you one way or another. But generally, we don't have such great happy feelings towards those who are afflicting us. But hey, because the Lord is righteous, because we know his promises for us, we can pray even in the midst of our suffering, knowing what's true of all mankind, that we're lost until we find our hope in him. But that is the case of the people who are afflicting us. Pray for them. They were once in their same shoes. So, all in all, I think Psalm 129 is a call for confidence in the Lord. I think we gain this confidence by remembering our suffering and our pain, recounting the deliverance from suffering, and trusting that God will keep his promises. Why? Because he's righteous, he doesn't change. That he'll keep his promises to deliver us from suffering. Whatever may come, we'll endure because of who God is, because he is the one who has saved us, made us spotless and blameless before God, and because of his great love for us. So when we are confident in the Lord, when we're trusting in all that, trusting in these promises, we can pray even for the wicked, pray against their schemes that God's plans would ultimately prevail because we know they will and that they would turn back and be healed. That if this community can sit here and go through all that they have suffered, a history of suffering, I'm going to say far worse than the history of Christianity or at least a whole lot longer. And still praise and find their confidence in God through doing this, through coming together, recounting his goodness, and trusting in those promises, then I think we can do the same. And in closing, I'd like to share a conversation with I had with my mom. She's the pretty neat lady I referred to at the beginning of this. Um, because... Man, knowing some of the things in her life, I found out more yesterday. <laughs> um, she, for me, is a picture of those who endure through suffering. It's, it's a picture just like Israel. It's, it's confident assurance and trust in God through all that she's been through. Because like Israel, she's been uh, afflicted in her suffering since her youth. So I'm going to share with you what I, what I talked about with her um, so before I get into kind of what she quoted to me, I was just kind of furiously typing as she was talking. Um, my mom was abused by her father several times as a little girl. He was an alcoholic. He was an addict. Um, kind man when he wasn't uh, influenced by any of those substances, but unfortunately, alcoholic and addict there's a lot of times where he wasn't such a kind man and my mom and her siblings talked about cigarette burns on my uncle's back um, and I asked her thinking about this it's just mom what do you think of this psalm what do you think of this because for you I've seen such confidence in God through all that you've been through it's like how do you see this playing out in your life and she started telling me a story and, and does what Israel's doing and, and, and recounts her suffering at the end of the conversation is actually quite great she said what happened with my father God intervened and made sure she, uh, that she knew she was loved and worthy so many times she thought that she'd be better off dead and she chose to pray and believe instead that God had a plan for her chose to trust in the promises of God. She was told by her dad that she would never make anyone happy, but now she has. 
She said, it doesn't bother me now. It's like sometimes when I think about it, yes, I get mad because that suffering's very real. It's still very hard. But she says regardless um, that now she can be at some peace in it. At nursing school, no one thought she was going to make it, but now she's a pretty dang good nurse. And I'm not saying that because I'm biased in her son. Um, but it's like even our youth pastor would tell her, it's like you're an excellent nurse and you know it. Because he asked her one day, he's like, you're a pretty good nurse. She was like, well, he's like, no, you're an excellent nurse and you know it. My kids come to you when they have uh, issues that they really need to go see a doctor for, for because they want to hear you and your <laughs> diagnosis when you send us to the hospital is always the same thing as what they tell us. And it's like you knew before. She ended up pretty well and nobody thought she'd do well there. And she said she had her first pacemaker at 27. I was like, you're on pacemaker number four now, right? She's like, oh, more than that, more than that. If God had not been there to give me the signs of what I needed, I would be dead. She passed out with my oldest brother when he was a baby uh, at home alone with him. Uh, and she woke up with him on her chest and was able to call my dad who called an ambulance. And the whole time her heart rate was 22 beats per minute. They made her sing songs in the ambulance to kind of get her heart rate up. Because she just had a really slow heartbeat and needed the pacemaker for that. So if God hadn't given me the signs I would need it, I'd be dead. Anytime something bad has happened to me, God has intervened. At one point, the pacemaker, the atrial lead, which sticks on her heart and shocks it to, to make it beat like it should, ended up in her neck. Now, how that happens, I have no idea. Right? That <laughs> sounds like a really bad mistake somewhere. Um, but it wasn't shocking her heart. Instead, it's shocking her up here. So it shouldn't have kept, her heart shouldn't have kept going. That was the thing that was supposed to save her. She should have died in her sleep. In December 2003, she had a 100% normal mammogram. Went every year to have a mammogram. And three months later, she woke up. One breast had swollen overnight. And she went to the hospital and found out that she had precancerous cells. Uh, that if that didn't happen, she wouldn't have gone to the hospital until a year later. And she would have had stage four cancer by that point. So this night of waking up like that and going to discover that soon saved her life. She very well could have died when I was sick. She could have died a lot of times, honestly. Um, I don't mean to say that flippantly, but just in reality. Uh, she still lost both of her breasts, still had to have a double mastectomy in 2004. And that's actually why we moved down to Texas from Pennsylvania when I was in first grade. It's because of the cold after that without having that muscle in her chest was just so brutal. She said my bones would hurt because of how cold it was, you know, once that muscle was taken out. And just after this, my nana, her mom, died in 2005. She was coming for Christmas that year and was going to be staying with us, going to be living with us. Um, but she had a, a, her bowels ruptured and, and failed. And it was my mom on her, her mother's deathbed talking to her about the decision to come off the machines and pass. She was the one talking through that to make sure that was what her mom wanted. And my nana made that decision. None of her kids did. But she had to sit there and communicate and comfort her mom, the woman she loves most, who had been there for her through so much. And just be able to look at her confidently and say, Mom, Jesus is waiting for you. And this part of the story I never heard till yesterday. She also said, Mom, if Dad has made it to heaven, he won't be drunk. He won't be drinking. I'd never met my grandfather, but if I had to guess where he was for a long time, I wasn't guessing something pretty. And she's still holding out hope of the one who abused her. That God could still transform his life and save him and, and hoping that he did. And then after her mom passed away, she sat there and comforted the doctor who tried to, or who didn't try, who performed surgery on my Nana to try and save her uh, the night before when no one else would operate because that allowed enough time for my mom and her siblings to actually get there and say goodbye and to comfort her mom. But this was the first patient my Nana was that this uh, doctor had ever lost, the surgeon had ever lost. She felt so terrible and was weeping. Mom said, at that point, I wasn't even crying. I was just comforting her because she knew exactly, trusting in the promises of God where her mother was. 
and could sit there in her own affliction and pain and comfort another. And she gave a, a, a picture of my Nana without the tubes and everything to this nurse with a thank you letter. And that, um, I think I said nurse, that doctor still carries it around to this day as a reminder. And she was able to have such an impact on one of the most painful moments of her life, if not the most painful moment of her life. I asked her, I said, Mom, how have you not lost confidence in God? Because one of these things, you know, is, is enough reason for a lot of people. And everything I'm about to say, she said through tears, because the pain is still real. Honestly, I think I did when I was really little. For a little bit, because I never understood how my dad could hurt me, my sister, and my brother. My Nana and Mom never lost faith. They were role models. And I could see the good in this world every day. There's also bad that I see. But the times I needed God most, he was there. He was the reason I pushed forward because I know he never stopped loving me. He protected me in a lot of ways. She said, I should be dead, really. I, I shouldn't have lived when my heart rate was 22. I shouldn't have found out I had cancer a year before I did. How can I not believe him? How can I not trust that he wants what's good for me? To look in the eyes of my kids and grandkids and not realize I am blessed beyond belief. Things of this world hurt, but God's love for me is greater than all of these things, all the things of this world. So I guess I'm a bigger fighter than I thought because I haven't given up and I don't plan to start now. You can still love someone and not like what they've done. I wanted to hate my dad. I wanted to hate him greatly. And I kept going back to the Ten Commandments that I need to honor them, not hate them. And I, I didn't like what happened. My dad was a sick man. And, and this is, is, is the thing that, that gets me. Is she recognized this wasn't you know, just a, a horrible human. This was a sick man, a broken man in need of Christ too. He was a sick man. The things of this world made him what he was. Alcohol, drugs. I'm pretty sure my dad looked at pornography. and you Because know, when he wasn't drinking, he wasn't that person. And no one was hurt. I said, did you ever pray for him? She said, yes, all the time. And I told him I prayed for him. And when I told him, he actually stopped drinking, went to rehab, and was great for 10 years. And those were actually pretty good years, but then he started drinking again. And you know what? When I realized that I could love him for being my dad and hate what he did, I realized I could be free. It wasn't me. It wasn't something I did. I didn't have to condemn myself when, or him. And when you were growing up like that, you think it's your fault. You, and when I realized all this, I became a better person. I was never really angry. I, I cried a lot. I learned that I, I can't let these things define who I am. So how did you pray for him? Still praying that God, she said, I asked God to heal my dad, me, and my family. She said, I used to pray differently. I was Catholic, said a lot of repetitive prayers. But I got on my knees and prayed. I sought the Lord. She said, I still pray because I can't always get on my knees anymore. Sometimes I just have to lean on the bed, but I'm still praying. And I asked her, I said, can I share your story? Because, you know, to, to me, to look back on all of this and see just time and time again the things she suffered through and still trust that God is good to still lean in and see his deliverance I, I'm still amazed by it and she said yes pretty quickly and this hasn't been shared in a group setting ever so uh, <laughs> she said like after that and she kept going on she's like Patrick look at my birth I was born a 28-week premature baby in 1966. There were no NICUs. I should have died. She said, um, they, they didn't give them much hope. They said I would likely die when I went home. And my mom and my nana, which means my nana and her nana, both looked at them and said, we'll see about that. She said, I was two pounds and three ounces. I've had steaks that weigh more. <laughs> she said, I went home at five and a half pounds three months later, too little to nurse before formula. They fed me through a syringe. Also, I had German measles when I was five and nearly died. I'm only alive because my mother and my nana prayed for me and sought God on my behalf. They didn't give me much hope when I was born or in that moment, they being doctors. Both times, they, my nana and my mom said, we'll see about that. 
I learned how to pray by watching them. I watched them pray for people they didn't even like because they were sick. I watched my mom pray for people she didn't even like a whole lot. I'm only alive today because from the moment of my birth, they have prayed over my life. That's where we're wrapping up. I see in this story and hearing my mom confidence in the Lord. She, she's constantly had confidence in the Lord because she can look back and it's like, how is that not God? How is that not God? He did this here, here, here. All that I've suffered, and she suffered a lot of great and terrible things. But I think she gets it. I think she gets what Israel was doing as they sing this song, that we express our laments and our afflictions in biblical community because in doing so, we remind ourselves of God's faithfulness. We uh, recount our afflictions through the faithfulness of God in community. We affirm over and over again why we should have confidence in the Lord. We build confidence in the Lord through that, through remembering, through our prayers for the wicked, through uh, praying for each other and just constantly remembering God is faithful. He is righteous. He's made these promises. He's going to keep them. He has always done so in the past. Same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. He never changes and he never will. He's our righteous king. The reason for our confidence, because he's a firm foundation, this fact will not change. And just proof that this brings confidence in the Lord. She's struggling right now with a, a, a situation uh, she's dealing with, um, work and, and, and family. And she said, you know, I feel, felt really stressed before talking to you, but I don't anymore. And I was worried about this conversation because I'm bringing up a lot of painful things in the past. And she can look back and say, no, God delivered me. And in this moment, not stressed anymore because it builds that confidence that what he's done in the past, he will continue to do again. So still water, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may yourselves overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. We're going to pray.